Hello, my name is Dr. Anthony Chafee. I'm an American medical doctor specializing in neurosurgery, but I've also done quite extensive research into diet and nutrition and how that affects health and chronic disease. Uh, I've been interviewed by people such as Dr. Sean Baker and others of that, uh, that genre um, and done debates and so forth between carnivore and, and, and vegan um, advocates. Uh, one quite recently with uh, ACNAM, which is an Australian nutritional uh, medical board. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the points that I made in that debate. Uh, we only had seven minutes to go over it, so we had to sort of rapid fire some of these things. Uh, and unfortunately, couldn't uh, do much of a back and forth. Um, but I just wanted to go over some of those points and just flesh those out a bit. Um, and hopefully people find that interesting. So just talking about just the, the difference between vegan and carnivorism. Um, so first of all, we just have to look at what are humans as a species. So animals, all animals in the wild have species specific nutrition. They have an evolutionary niche that they all evolve to have, and that's going to be their optimal diet, what they evolved on. Okay. So you have to think in that context. Now, what are, what are humans? All the big studies, all the best data shows that we actually are carnivores as a species. That's the kind of animal that we are. Now, can we live on other things? Can we survive on them? Yes. Does that mean that that's optimal? No. We came from an herbivorous background. We have some of those traits left over. We have some people that, you know, had, um, you know, the, the agricultural revolution and has some defenses, but again, we're talking optimal. So what is the optimal nutrition for human beings? Um, why does this matter? Well, it matters because plants and other sorts of food, what we call it food, but food is species specific. So the food to a giraffe is different than the food to a gorilla. That's different than the food to a zebra. That's different than the food to, you know, a, a woolly mammoth and a, and a dolphin and so forth. So you, you need to eat what your species eats, okay? Um, you know, you can ask any zookeeper, they'll tell you that, you know, if you feed an animal something that, you know, doesn't eat in the wild, something that didn't evolve on, it gets very sick. But what does it get sick with? It gets obesity, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, autoimmune disorders, okay? Dogs and cats, known carnivores, and yet we give them grain and plant-based kibble. And they get sick. They get the same things. We get the same things. Veterinarians are now calling these human diseases and they're saying that animals like pets household pets are are the amount of human diseases that they're seeing is is rapidly increasing and it's gone dramatically up in the 1970s in america for instance the average age of the average life expectancy of a golden retriever was 17 years now it's nine years okay that's not from you know you know aggressive breeding it was already a pure breed okay that's from feeding it the wrong thing and it dies young, all right? That's happening to humans as well. What veterinarians are calling human diseases, we actually used to call Western diseases because we only saw these in Western cultures that had agriculture. These were the diseases of the West, okay? You can look this up, you know, in, in history books. It's, you know, it's all over the place. Um, and that's because we didn't see this in native populations. Right. So in Native Americans and Native Australians and so forth, these people lived as predominantly pure carnivores. You know, you know, they might know which plants to eat when and if they were starving or to use medicinally. But what they ate when they could get it and predominantly ate was a pure meat diet. This is well documented. You can go back hundreds and hundreds of years and see this. OK. They didn't get the diseases of the West, except when they ate the food of the West. When Native Americans and Native Australians eat a Western diet, they are four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, all the rest, because they didn't have exposure to agricultural revolution like other, other people did. And so they don't have as many protections. Now, the people that, that had the agricultural revolution you know, 8,000 years ago or so, they have some protections, but they still get these diseases. I remember hearing, hearing this fact uh, about the, you know, being four times more likely to get all these diseases when I was a young child. And I remember thinking to myself, well, doesn't that mean that the food is causing the disease? Because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease just at a lower rate, you know? And what is it 
that they are eating that we're not? What are we eating that they're not? Well, I didn't know it at the time, but the answer to that is they were eating a pure carnivore diet. They were omitting all these species inappropriate foods. Now, you look at other studies, there's quite a lot of studies, there's a stable isotope study, which looked at the bones of early humans and Neanderthals and, and were able to look at certain isotopes and see what they ate and were able to compare this to other animals of the day. And they found that humans were not only carnivores, but they were hyper carnivores. We had a higher carnivore rating than you know, lions and hyenas alive at the same time in the same area. So this is, this is a very, very well-established fact. There's also the Isra a study out of Israel that showed that people were hyper carnivores going back at least two million years, two and a half million years. This is because likely the ice ages, our ancestors about 8 million years ago were, were herbivorous. They split off because they started eating meat. They started eating more and more meat, more and more meat. They started having more human adaptations. Our teeth got smaller. Our jaws got smaller because we're eating softer and softer food. We're not chewing on sticks all day like a gorilla. And then our brains got bigger because we couldn't take things down with our mouth. We couldn't take things down with our claws because we don't kill things with our mouth and our claws. That's why we don't look like lions. But we did develop our brains. We had to develop our brains because we didn't have the claws, we didn't have the teeth. And so we figured out tactics and tools and we figured out how to take down a woolly mammoth and take it, take it apart with tools and with our brains. And that's why we live in houses and lions don't, okay? So why is it that you know eating outside of your species specific diet can be harmful to you? Well. The, the reason for that is that plants are living creatures and they want to stay living creatures. If you eat them, they die. All living things have a defense and plants, because they can't move or fight back like a, you know, an animal can, who can run away or can fight you, they have to use poison as their main deterrent. I learned in seventh grade biology that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous so that less and less animals could eat them so that they can survive and thrive and, and not go extinct. And animals are becoming more and more adapted to specific poisons and specific plants so that they can eat that plant and survive and thrive as well. But other things couldn't necessarily. And so this was their dedicated food source. So that was, a, that was an evolution, evolutionary advantage, okay? Think koalas, pandas, they eat one plant. There's 340,000 plants in the world. Koalas eat one, pandas eat one. Cows, horses, grazing animals, they eat grass, that's it. The other things, they get sick or they die. You know, the leaves that a giraffe eats are different from the leaves that a gorilla eats. Those are different from the leaves that a deer eats. You mix those leaves around, they all get sick or die. So, you know, you know, we know this inherently, okay? If you get lost in the woods and you run out of food, you can't just eat any random plant, okay? Everyone knows that you'd get very sick, you, you could die. People have died, okay? So, you know, this is this is a universal truth throughout the plant kingdom and the fungus kingdom, okay, is that plants use poisons. If you think about it, all plants are poisonous. It's just that certain animals have evolved the ability to break down specific plant, specific poisons and specific plants. But if they haven't evolved to eat that plant, that plant is bad for them. And that goes for us too. We've known since the 1980s from the work of Professor Bruce Ames out of UC Berkeley that plants, vegetables, things that we eat all the time, or, well, not me, but, you know, used to, you guys anyway, you know, they contain quite a lot of poisons and they were comparing this to pesticides because they were trying to ban the pesticides in the 80s because everyone was getting sick. And they said, well, you know, it must be from the pesticides. And, you know, he looked at that and he's like, well, you know, really the, the pesticides we've been using for 80 years without any problem, those pesticides. And so he did the studies and he found that there's actually 10,000 times more naturally occurring poisons in the plants and the vegetables like spinach than there is in you know, the pesticides we spray on them industrially by weight, okay? So that's 99.99% of the toxic elements are in the plant itself, not the pesticide. And he also found that it was much more carcinogenic. The naturally occurring poisons were far more carcinogenic than the pesticides we sprayed on them industrially. That's why we still have pesticides because he showed scientifically that you know, the pesticides are just a drop in the bucket compared to the plant itself. And if you're willing to eat the plant, well, you know, the, the pesticides aren't really, you know, what you have to worry about, okay? Fast forward to when I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle. 
we were again, you know, learning things you know, that you know, plants protect themselves by using you know chemical deterrents, uh, but we were looking at it in a cancer perspective. So we were looking at carcinogens, and we learned day one that Brussels sprouts had 136 known human carcinogens. This is 20 years ago. Okay, mushrooms, just white mushrooms, had over 100 known carcinogens. We were getting lists, spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, you name it. They all had 60, 80, or over 100 known human carcinogens each. And we know that they're abundant, you know, based on the work of Professor Ames. Uh, we were very blown away by this. Uh, we thought that he must be joking. He must be having us on. And we're looking around wildly, looking for, you know, who, who's in on the joke and who's smirking. But no one was. And I remember thinking in my head, but, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And he must have read our minds because he just looked at us and gave us a funny look and said, I don't eat salads. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. So I said, okay, screw plants. And that was my start on a carnivore journey, even though I, I didn't realize it at the time. I just knew that plants were trying to kill me. I'm not going to eat plants. So I went to the store. And I just bought things that didn't have plants. You know, everything has plants. Everything someone else makes is going to have plants and sugar and things like that. So I was just walking around. I just, there was nothing I could buy. And you know, I came across some eggs. I was like, okay, eggs. Eggs don't have plants in them. You know, meat. Meat doesn't come from plants. Milk. Milk doesn't come from plants. So I just ate eggs, meat, and milk for five years. I was playing, you know, high-level rugby at the time. I was training, you know, sometimes eight, ten hours a day while in university. I couldn't get tired. I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't get sore. I don't get sore anymore. That soreness is actually from the tox toxic elements in the plants causing inflammation, pain, and swelling and making you stiff and sore, which is a deterrent. The plant is saying, do not eat me. I'll make you feel bad. But we eat this stuff all the time. And so we always feel bad. We don't even realize it. We think that's normal. It's not normal. Okay. So you know, since then, I, I literally felt like a different breed of human. My body works in very different ways. And I was, I was experiencing this in, in, you know, my rugby and my athletic career. I was playing professionally in England. And I remember slipping off of that without really realizing it. And I remember thinking to myself a few months in, you know, I didn't feel as superhuman as I normally do. Like, you know, what's going on? I'm not training as hard. You know, I was 25, like, gosh, am I, am I over it now? My body is just breaking down. You know, I figured out later that it was it was because I, you know, some plants had mixed in because, you know, some of the meat was breaded and, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. And I was like, well, you know, it's not, is it that much? Does it make that big of a deal? Well, it did. It made it quite a big deal. Okay. So, you know, there are other things in plants. So that, that's sort of a general thing, but let's talk about some specifics. Okay. Any botanist on earth can tell you this and they can tell you a lot more. Uh, you know, this is any any introductory botany book can show you this as well. Okay, there there are quite a lot of things. All right, so quite a lot of plants um, poison you by making you very sensitive to light. Okay, there's a thing called celery dermatitis where people eat a lot of celery or handle celery, pick celery, and things like that. They get horrible burns in the sun. They have to wear hats, long sleeve shirt, gloves because they will absolutely scorch in the sun. Okay, think of how many vegans have a good tan. Okay. Limes, they do this as well. They have oil in the skin. This is an unripe fruit. Those seeds aren't ready yet. They, the, that tree does not want you to eat that. So if you start grabbing that, picking that, pulling that, it doesn't want that. So it soaks this oil in your skin. You have very bad burns. You know, we, we have documented, you know, second degree burns just from sun exposure after handling limes. It actually happened to my younger brother uh, as, as a child. We didn't know what, what it was. We thought it was like an allergic reaction, but no, this is what it was. Then think about cyanide. There's 3,500 different plants that use cyanide that we know of. Uh, almonds are one of them, okay? There's different amounts of, of cyanide in almonds, but anywhere from a pound to two pounds of almonds, so you know, 400 to 800 grams of almonds, is a lethal dose of cyanide in an adult. And yet we give this stuff to children and tell them that it's good for them. So that's, that's pretty wild to me that, that we do that and we just play these games with kids. And, and you know, almonds have been containing cyanide is not uh, you know, a little known fact. That, that's a widely known thing. And yet people say, oh, well, yeah, there's cyanide in it, but they just assume that there's really not that much. There's quite a lot. 
You know, I've, I've sat down and just ha you know, eaten handfuls of almonds while watching television and easily eaten half a pound. You know, that's, that's half a lethal dose of cyanide. That's insane. And so even if it doesn't kill you, like that's not good for your body, okay? There's nightshades, you know, be deadly belladonna, tobacco. These things are quite harmful. They contain solanine, among other things. This can kill you, okay? We avoid belladonna. This is something that people have used as, as poisons going back centuries. And people knew for centuries that you don't eat nightshades. And then all of a sudden we, we forgot this or, or thought that it didn't really matter that much. But potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, these were all in the nightshade family. And they all contain solanine and other toxic elements. 70 people a year still die from eating potatoes. Potatoes, okay? But it's not that far-fetched, think about it. I'm sure you know, most people have learned that you take potatoes, you need to keep them in a dark place under the, in the cupboard or something like that, because if it turns green, it's bad, you can't eat it. Well, what does bad mean? It means it's poisonous and it's deadly poisonous. If it starts growing a root, you have to cut out the whole root or just throw the whole thing away because now that's poisonous, deadly poisonous, that can kill you. People that don't realize how bad that is, eat it and they die or you know because they have to if they're starving, I suppose. But that's a serious thing. And even though a normal potato, when it does, when it's not in those forms, is it, isn't necessarily gonna kill you, it's not good for you, okay? And then there's carbohydrates and so forth, which, which fundamentally disrupt your, your metabolic system and so forth, uh, which is maybe a topic for another time. But you know, I argue that you know, what, what people call a fasting state, a so-called fasting state is actually our primary metabolic state. It's the primary metabolic state of nearly all animals in the wild. That's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. Okay, So when you're on a carnivore diet, you're in that metabolic state, just like a cow, just like a gorilla, just like a wolf, just like a lion. Okay. So what else about plants? Well, we know that we can't be vegan or herbivores because plants you know, lack very vital nutrients that you, you cannot get from anything else, okay? Okay, so if you, know, you need to supplement, vegans need to supplement, vegetarians need to supplement, they, they're generally quite deficient. Look at India, they have high uh, rates of vegetarianism and so forth, but they're generally ovo-lacto vegetarians, so they are getting some animal sourced nutrition, but they're also very nutrient deficient. They have quite bad um, nutritional deficiencies. They, they, they're very, uh, you know, they're very deprived in that sense of nutrients, okay? So if you need to take supplements, obviously this cannot be something that we evolved on because we didn't have supplements and, and GNC 50,000 years ago, even, a hundred years ago, really, for the things that we have available now. We certainly didn't have them a hundred thousand thousand years ago, two million years ago, when people were living as hyper carnivores, as we've seen from all the studies. Okay. So if you need to supplement, then by definition your diet is de is deficient. Okay. So that can't be our evolved diet. That can't be our optimal diet. There are quite a number of things: B12, D3, K2. Uh, you're not going to get enough vitamin A. You'd have to eat three pounds of carrots a day just to get enough, oh, sorry, six pounds of carrots a day just to get enough vitamin A a day, okay? So that's not going to happen. You're not going to do that. Uh, and then there's other things, the essential fatty acids such as DHA and so forth. This does not exist in plants. You know, we make some of the essential fatty acids that we need, but we don't make that much. We don't make enough, okay? And that is what grows your brain. That's what grows your nervous system. And if you don't get these in sufficient amounts, your brain will be underdeveloped. And you also your brain will start to decay. There's quite a lot of large studies showing that higher saturated fat intakes, higher animal fat protein and so forth uh, in the diet protects against Alzheimer's, protects against dementia, protects against Parkinson's, actually protects against heart disease. Okay, we'll get to that later. So on a carnivore diet, you don't need to supplement. Okay, the Inuits didn't do it. I don't do it. The Native Australians didn't do it. You know, Genghis Khan and the Mongol horde who just ate horse meat, drank horse blood, they didn't do it. Uh, and you don't need to do it, okay? Because it's, it's our evolved diet. If it's a, our evolved diet, then by definition, it has everything that you need. Now, there's an organization called SIPS, S-I-P-P-S. This is a group of pediatricians in Italy. 
And they've come out with this. They've, they said flat out, you know, any, any diet that you need pharmacological supplementation is a bad diet. It's not a good diet. And this is not something that should be pushed on kids. This was in, in response to people trying to push a vegan diet for children, which is honestly criminal. There, there have actually been cases of, of vegan mothers who are breastfeeding and their children dying from the breast milk because it's so deficient in the nutrients and probably have a lot of toxins as well, okay? So that's quite harmful. You know, kids that are raised vegan have much higher rates of uh, autism, have much higher rates of, uh, you know, uh, short stature, reduced, you know, uh, bone mineral density, muscle density, and so forth. This is bad for them, okay? The autism thing, that there's quite a lot of studies that show, you know, correlation with food and so forth that, you know, more meat, higher saturated fat during pregnancy protects against autism. However, there's causative studies as well. Um, out of, I think, the University of Texas at Austin, they showed that there was a type of autism. And what is autism? Autism is a misdevelopment of your neurons. Okay. So your neurons didn't develop properly, didn't work quite right for whatever reason, and you have a certain form of autism. So one of those forms of autism was found to be caused by a lack of carnitine. Carnitine is thought to be a non-essential amino acid, meaning that we make it, but not everyone makes enough of it. Not everyone makes it at all. And so they found that if you don't have sufficient amounts of carnitine, carnitine is you know, integral for the development of you know, proper development of neurons. And so if you don't have that, you can't develop it properly and you'll get a specific kind of autism. Well, carnitine doesn't exist in plants. It doesn't exist in fungus. It only exists in meat, to some degree in most animal source foods, but there's a ton of it in red meat. Okay, what is the first thing that vegetarians do? They drop red meat because that's the worst, right? Well, no, actually it's the best. Vegans, they don't need any animal pro products at all. Okay, so they're not gonna get any carnitine at all. So if you have a vegetarian who just cuts out red meat and their kid doesn't make any carnitine at all, well, you know, the chicken and fish and, you know, eggs and so forth that they're eating probably to a small degree isn't going to be sufficient source of carnitine to develop their brain properly. And they'll get this form of autism. And then vegans who eat no animal source protein at all and get none of these nutrients, get no carnitine, even if they have a slight deficiency, they'll get this form of autism as well. So this is, this is quite serious and honestly, you could argue that this was child abuse to do this, and that, that may ruffle some feathers, but I, I think if you think about this and you understand, you know, the science behind it, you know, it's it's hard to argue that it's not. Obviously, you know, people aren't doing this intentionally. If they were, then that would certainly be child abuse. Parents want to do the best for their kids, by and large, and sometimes they'll put them on a vegan diet because they're being told that this is the best thing, but I can tell you for a cold, frozen fact that is the worst thing you can do for your kid, okay? So you know, this cannot be an Arvald diet, all right? It has poison. It doesn't have the proper nu nutrients. It has low, bioavail low bioavailability of the nutrients that it does have. You don't really absorb the proteins that it does have. You say, you know, you know, that's 30 grams of protein from plant source versus 30 grams of protein from animal source. You will absorb nearly all of those 30 grams from an animal source. You will, you'll absorb very little of the 30 grams of plant protein. We've seen this in tons of studies. Patients with stomas where they, you know, they have to um, you know, have a bag where their feces come out. You know, they say it, you know, have to, some sort of surgery, some sort of issue, they have to rest their bowel or maybe remove their bowel. We can see this. We can see that when you eat animals, animal protein, you absorb nearly all of it. It's not coming out in the bag. Whereas it plant protein like soy and so forth, that almost all of it comes out. And so this gets down to your colon, your, you know, the bacteria, you start getting work on it and you get, you know, nasty byproducts. Okay. So, so what are some other things? You know, you think about, you know, sugar, sugar is in everything. Um, this is something that, you know, we, we enjoy, but it's something that, that's thought to be evolved because we recognize this is safe because there's nothing really that contains fructose, which is the sweet part of sugar that is acutely poisonous for us that will kill us that day. So we recognize this as a quick hit of energy that we can survive on and then get our normal meal, okay? But long-term, this causes very serious problems. It's also addictive. 
gives an it gives a, a dopamine signal to the addiction parts of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and meth. And it kills the same areas of your brain as meth to the same extent as meth. Okay, we see this on MRI studies. Okay, then in 2009, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig from UCSF published. Uh, I, I thought you know quite quite brilliant work and published dozens of things since then, written books and so forth. I'm sure you guys can look him up. I'm sure most of you have heard of him. Uh, they showed that fructose acts in your body, is broken down by your liver to the same byproducts as alcohol. Okay, and you get the same disease profile from those bro breakdown products as you do alcohol. Okay, because it's the same thing. So you have fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease. Okay, it's even you know in, indicated in cancer, it feeds cancer and so forth. Lustig's trying to show, or you know, trying to see if he can show uh, if there's a causative nature of fructose with cancer, and you know, and then it's, it's associated with Alzheimer's and so forth. Okay, so you know, this is associated with Alzheimer's. You know, this is able to, to influence the brain and potentially cause Alzheimer's, de de serious degeneration, uh, you know, fatal degeneration of an adult mature healthy brain, what's that doing to a children's brain? What's that doing to a developing brain or a fetus? It's not gonna be good, okay? So you have to think about this. You know, kids like sugar, oh, they like sugar. Yeah, of course they do, it's a drug. You give them cocaine, they'll like that too. You know, I'm sure people have seen on YouTube that little you know, two-year-old kid, uh, I think probably in Indonesia, where he like smokes three packs of cigarettes a day and they, well, oh, you know, he just really likes it. So, you know, you know he seems healthy. So we'll just let him keep smoking. He's like, yeah, he's healthy now. That's not gonna last too long, okay? So what Dr. Lustig also showed was that it's sugar that is actually the, the disease process involved in heart disease, not cholesterol, okay? It actually is, it metabolizes into SDLDL, VLDL, and these things are then glycated and you know, are a part of an inflammatory process that then precipitates atherosclerosis, okay? It's not from the cholesterol you get from animal fat, okay? So cholesterol was actually never the problem. And that's something that's, that's come up more recently. You know, in 2015, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, reported and published actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in you know, the 50s and 60s and so forth talking about how there was there was studies you know showing that or suggesting that sugar caused heart disease which now we know it does okay and at the time they said okay you know we need to cover this up and so in their own words they they detailed how they paid off three harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol was causing heart disease when it was really sugar and one of those professors was named head of the USDA in 1965 and then magically, the USDA declares unequivocally that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol, stop eating both, and it changed the world, okay? Think about it. After this declaration, you know, late 70s, 19, you know, early 80s, they, you know, the, the, the food habits of Americans changed dramatically and the rest of the world sort of started dropping like dominoes after it and they all started seeing the obesity and health and chronic disease epidemic that Americans first saw in the 80s. Okay, well, you know, you know, as Richard Feynman said, it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. So the theory was that cholesterol from fat, from animal fat causes heart disease. Okay, so in America, we reduced our, our cholesterol intake by 30, 30%, reduced red meat by 33%, increased fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively, and also sugar and, uh, and carbohydrates and so forth. What were the results? This was with hundreds of millions of people. What were the results? The obesity rate tripled, heart disease tripled, stroke rate tripled, cancer rates tripled, type two diabetes, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neurodegenerative delays such as autism, all these things increased exponentially and they all increased at the exact same time okay these things almost didn't exist before then now they're the only things we treat right so heart disease tripled when we reduced cholesterol okay you can't say that cholesterol causes heart disease when you reduce cholesterol and heart disease increases dramatically if anything you can say it's protective and that's actually what we're seeing now in the studies there's quite a lot of big studies that came out in 2015 and beyond that back this up 
with hundreds of thousands of people found that people on statins were either equivalent or having worse outcomes. Okay, why is that? This is something that's supposed to, it's supposed to be saving so many lives. No, it's not. There's a study with 60,000 people over the age of 65 on statins. And people that were on statins with lower cholesterol were having worse outcomes. All right, statins cause, have side effects. Um, and you know you have to you have to take that into account when you take any medication. You have to contend with the side effects. So this is doing something that now we know you don't need to do, and it has side effects. So this is something you really need to think about. This isn't medical advice. It's just general you know general knowledge. Okay, this is something that you should really take seriously and think about, and you know and re-examine the studies. There are other studies with hundreds of thousands of people finding that people with higher LDL cholesterol, so-called bad cholesterol, are having less heart attacks, less strokes. They're cardioprotective, they're neuroprotective, okay? You know, people keep keep pushing this, and there was, um, you know, there was a cardiologist that was on the other side of the debate who's argued for the vegan side, and we didn't really get a chance to sort of go back and forth, but I just wanted to ask him, if you think that cholesterol is the end-all, be-all for heart disease, tell me why... 50% of people who have heart attacks have low or normal LDL cholesterol. Answer that one, okay? So if you look at that, there's not even really association. And now we actually know that all those correlated studies that proved that cholesterol caused heart disease were actually fraudulent, okay? And you look at the Framingham study, this is a, this is a cardinal study in, in cardiology showing a strong association with total cholesterol and heart disease. The problem with that is that they misrepresented their own findings. They concluded something that was not supported by their own data, and this has come out, okay? But not everybody knows about it, and that's a problem, okay? So, you know, you'll hear different people say, well, you know, I went vegan and everything got better, okay? Maybe. Not everyone does, though. It depends on where you're coming from and where you're going to, all right? You know, I ask people because they think vegan, they think, oh, I just dropped meat. And that's the only change I made. <clears throat> I started calling myself a vegan, then good things happen. And so I asked them, okay, so you kept eating cookies and cakes, smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I stopped going out to eat. I don't eat any, you know, any um, sugar. I don't, you know, I don't use, uh, you know, sugary sauces. I don't drink alcohol. I, I make whole food, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so they're making a lot of changes. And, and, you know, one of those major changes is they're getting rid of added sugar and alcohol and so forth. And, but they're blaming the meat. Okay. So, you know, this is like saying, like, Oh, I, you know, I went vegan and stopped, you know, doing Coke and smoking cigarettes. And ugh, gosh, as soon as I stopped eating meat, I felt so much better. It's like, well, you know, there's a couple other things going on there, chief. So, and that's what you have to think about. Okay. Because also, you know, the, the omission of one harmful substance isn't enough. There, there are myriad harmful substances in the world, as we know, because every single plant has thousands of them, okay? And they all have different ones, predominantly. So, you know, you get rid of one bad thing. Let's say meat is bad for you, okay? But what about all the other bad things for you, okay? So that's not a really good argument, okay? Because just because something doesn't have arsenic doesn't mean it also doesn't have cyanide, okay? Which, you know, plants do, okay? And then you have to think, okay, well, just because it doesn't have meat doesn't mean it's good for you. Oreo cookies are, are vegan. Cigarettes are vegan. Alcohol is vegan. Cocaine is vegan. Heroin is vegan. Okay, just because calling something doesn't really you know tell you much. It just means no meat. So you know that's that's not really doing much for you. Okay, you have to you have to think past that. All right. So you know let's go to you know. You know, just a general thing. One of the other things that, that vegans have a problem with is, uh, you know, saying that animals are bad for the environment. But they couldn't be more wrong. Animals are vital for the environment. Animals are part of the environment. They're part of the ecosystem. Okay, this is a system of plants and animals living together, and they all have a part to play. Okay, animals recycle nutrients. They eat the dead, dead leaves, the dead wood, the dead grasses, and they recycle those nutrients. Okay, they eat down, you know, these these dead plants and so forth. And then they make room for the new plants to grow up because otherwise they're getting blocked out by the sun. This happens all over Africa. And to combat this, they try to burn off all these fields of dead grass because there aren't enough animals to eat them down. 
And if they don't burn them down so that the new grasses can grow up and the new plants can grow up, they'll turn to desert because the next plants will just die and they'll die and they'll die and they'll just turn into a barren land. So they're burning a billion hectares of grasslands a year in Africa, just in Africa. And one hectare, burning one hectare, uh, creates more pollution and worse pollution than 6,000 cars do in a year. So this is a wild, wild problem. Solution is animals. Um, we are losing about 27 billion tons of topsoil per year, okay? That's an area the size of Kentucky every year. This is because of farming. When you grow a farm, when you grow crops, you necessarily have to destroy an entire ecosystem. You kill all the plants, you kill all the animals, you grow one crop and then you kill the animals that are trying to eat them. Those plants draw out nutrients out of the ground and that can eventually become barren. This is why we have to use large scale fertilizers and so forth just to, just to grow anything. Well, and when you till this stuff up, the winds can hit it, the, you know, the rains can wash it away and you wash away topsoil, you blow away topsoil. This is what happened in the Dust Bowl in America in the 1930s. The middle of America, one of the most, one of the most you know, um, verdant areas in the world, this, this all of a sudden was turning into a desert. They couldn't grow, grow anything. It was, you know, I mean, you know, dust storms, all these sorts of things. Locust swarms, it sounded like a Bible story. And people thought it was. They thought this was this was for people's wickedness and so forth. And then they figured out, no, this is actually from farming. We're, we're tilling these massive, massive long tracks. And things are blowing up. They're losing the topsoil and so forth. Things couldn't grow because there was no topsoil. Topsoil, topsoil takes an insane amount of time to grow. It takes about 500 years to grow half an inch of topsoil, one centimeter. Okay? And so we almost did that to the middle of America, we almost turned it into a Sahara desert. And then we figured that out and we, you know, you know re revamped our entire farming structure and we were able to, to hold that off, but we're still losing an area the size of Kentucky a year, okay? You can only do that for so long. That is a, that is a very finite resource. Now I say the Sahara desert for a reason. The Sahara desert is man-made. That didn't used to be a desert. We have satellite Im infrared images showing that there were human civilizations all across what is now this hair desert. Egypt used to be jungles, not deserts. We have soil samples that were tested in the 1990s that found that actually when the pyramids were built, when the Sphinx was built, they were built in jungles. Okay. Then they had wide scale agriculture. They didn't really know what was going on. And this all turned to deserts. Okay. In the you know the Egypt had the Nile River flooded every year and the silt would replenish the nutrients from the soil. I learned that when I was a kid. Well, what does that mean? That means that it has to replenish the nutrients every single year. They're saying this was why they were so prosperous and they could grow so much. Well, you have other places that don't have a Nile River. They don't have that, and they sop all these nutrients out of the soil and they start stop growing. They turn barren. They turn to desert. People like Alan Savory who's down in Zimbabwe, he's actually found that if you take massive herds of animals, bunch them moving like you like a, like a, like a herd would in the wild, they can actually revitalize deserts. He's reversing deserts. He's been doing this for 40 years or so, going through massive deserts and turning them green and verdant. He's done TED Talks, he's done different sorts of things, he's written books and textbooks and so forth. Very interesting guy, all right? Uh, there's another guy, Dr. Peter, ba Peter Ballastek, who's I've, who I've spoken to. Very interesting guy. He's a PhD in forage agronomy. You should look up his stuff. He talks about the science behind this, the science behind uh, you know, animal agriculture and husbandry, and how that affects the environment and how vital and necessary it is for, for the health of the world. Okay. So, you know, people always ask me, you know, what do you eat? You know, get me on a meal plan, these sorts of things. This is the easiest way of eating that. That, that exists. You know exactly what you can eat. You know exactly what you can't eat. You know, there's no rules as far as, you know, you have to, you have to limit calories and limit this and do this and have this many macros and so forth. You don't need that. This is natural. Nature will take care of it. You eat what you're hungry for. You eat what tastes good and it will stop tasting good when your body has enough nutrients. That's just a natural response. Things taste better 
when you're more hungry, when your body wants those nutrients more. So, you know, if a steak doesn't taste good, you're not hungry. If it does taste good, you are. So you eat what you want to eat. You eat when you want to eat. You don't have to eat in the morning or night. You don't have to intermittent fast or anything. You only need to do intermittent fasting if you're eating carbohydrates because you're trying to run out the clock on the insulin, get back into that primary metabolic state I mentioned earlier. So really what you eat is just meat, salt, water, okay? Any meat that you enjoy from any animal, it doesn't matter, fish, chicken, beef, lamb, it doesn't matter. You just wanna get enough fat, okay? Fat's very important. Animals in the wild get about 70, 80% of their calories from fat. Native Americans, they would cut off the back haunches and leave them, and they would take the rest of them because there wasn't much fat, okay? They'd make pemmican, there's 50-50 fat in meat, right? So the fat's very good for you. Think of the Inuits and so forth, people living up north. They, they eat blubber, okay? They're not fat. Okay, and that's another thing. You don't see fat animals in the wild. I remember thinking that as a kid, you know, why are animals just so, you know, so muscly and tough and we're just, you know, we're not, you know, we're just the only squishy animal on earth. It was explained to me that, you know, they exercise all the time because they're in the wild, so they're constantly moving, constantly exercising. But that doesn't explain animals in the zoo. You know, you have a, you have a, a lion or a zebra, you know, living in an enclosure the size of this room, that's the definition of a sedentary lifestyle. They're not going anywhere, okay? Have you ever seen a fat giraffe, fat zebra, fat lion? No, you know, they're not fat. You know, they're ripped. They look like they're on steroids, right? That's because they're eating what their species evolved to eat. They're eating what they're supposed to eat. And if you eat what your species evolved to eat, you will look like that as well. I've been doing this for years and years and years. People ask me all the time, you know, during COVID and so forth, you know, how do you work out? How do you work out all the time? You're like, you're so, uh, is in you know very good shape and so forth, and I'm like I haven't been to the gym in three months. You know I've done push-ups twice. I've gone running once, and they, they just don't believe me. But that is it. This is this is what the human animal looks like when you feed it species appropriate nutrition, and obviously when you work out, it does even more than that. I've played professional sports. I you know, have a long background in, in in exercise and so forth. And so, you know, when I work out, I work out a lot harder. I know how to work out. I know how to push myself. And, you know, I, it, I get more out of my workouts when on this way of eating and I retain it longer. It doesn't, it doesn't just go away. I, you know, I can maintain under 10% body fat just with, with eating as much as I want to and care to every day. My body just naturally it does that and yours will as well. It will get down to the body fat that your body wants you to be at genetically. Okay, so eat the fat. Um, my hard rule as far as what to eat is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. Okay, that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. Okay, so think about that when you're looking at an ingredients list. Generally, if something has an ingredients list, you shouldn't eat it because it's going to have a bunch of plants and sugar and crap like that that you don't want. Uh, the other question is alcohol. Um, do I drink alcohol? Very rarely, less than once a year. Okay. And if I were to drink, I would drink, generally drink, you know, hard stuff like just, just straight vodka or something like that, because I don't want all the mixtures. I don't want all the sugar. I don't want all the, the crap that's like in beer and wine and so forth. But, you know, whether or not I enjoy it, that's not really the point. Um, you know, because I, I've found that, you know, with my workouts and things like that, it takes about three weeks to get, you know, out from drinking one time, from going out one time, not even getting wrecked or having a horrible hangover. But I noticed that for three weeks, I can't work out as hard. I don't feel as good. I don't have the energy that I have. I don't have the sleep that I had for three full weeks. Okay. So it takes that long to get out of your system. And, you know, frankly, I would rather feel like a superhero 24 seven than feel drunk sometimes. Okay. That's just, you know, my choice. Um, so that's it. I hope that wasn't too much for you guys. I hope that just covered a lot of bases and, and that you guys found it helpful. Um, if there's anything else, I mean, you know, I'm probably going to go into some of these things in much more detail and, and, uh, talk, expand on them as well. And if there's any specific questions that you guys have and want me to address in a video, just let me know and I'll try to do that. Okay. All right. Thanks guys.